So in order to, to address this theme, um, on, on, on the left, Robert Amsterdam, um, who um, just arrived from Washington, D.C., and so grateful you spending some time with us tonight, Robert. Um, Robert is an international lawyer, 35 years of experience working on high-profile profile cases in emerging markets. Um, Robert's unique blend of political advocacy and international law has led to his retention by several world leaders, former prime ministers, former presidents, amongst other high-profile figures. But the law firm is also well known for its pro bono practice in human rights, including the defense of award-winning Democrat activist, and uh, I'll let you give some names a little bit later. Um, the firm has also represented um, a lot, a lot of people suffering from intimidation, political threats, to the point that the firm and Robert have been awarded in 2013 the Global Pro Bono Dispute of the Year Award from American Lawyer. On the right side of the table, Heather Hayes, well known to ICAD. <coughs> Heather is a, an international interventionist and uh, an FBI negotiator for hostage situations, um, international speaker as well, and um, with, I think, a, a very strong understanding of, of very threatening and stressing and you know, conflictual dynamics. So I think we got here two angles to discuss about the same um, issues we want to address tonight. Um, before I hand it over to, to our two speakers, I just want to remind you something that came across uh, my thoughts yesterday. Um, Dr. Jacob Bonofsky in 1973, in The Ascent of Man, beautiful series, reminded us two important things. First thing is that we, human beings, as a species, we are prey. We became predators for some reasons, evolution, different things. But at the core of a neural cent central neural system, at the core of our brain, the fear is central. And um, a lot of our functioning is fear management based or fear experience based. The second thing he highlighted is equally important. As a human being, member of that species, I always have to deal with two things. A very profound and complex internal individual structure, reigning myself, dealing with myself, together with the most unbelievable complex social structure created on the earth. So on one hand, the most complex machinery in the known universe, the human brain, and on the other hand, very complex social structures. And in trying to make those two um, sides of the spectrum together is the art of being human. This is what um, Jacob Bronowski proposed in 1975. And I just wanted to remind you all of that before we engage. Um, with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to you, Heather Robert. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody. It's an honor and a privilege to be here and I'm very excited about this evening's session and excited to be able to have some time and talk with you and sort of interview you, Robert. We had the opportunity to talk a little bit earlier and you are fascinating and um, have just done so many magnificent things for, you know, for what you call oppositional figures, I'll let you talk about this. So, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit in the beginning about how you got started. Like I, you know, I love a good bad boy, and you were telling me about how you got arrested for the first time at 16, and so, you know, just some what got you here, and, and who makes, you know, how, your makeup. Well, I think fear defines it. So I, I think we, um, uh, I, I've been confronting authority all my life and have never properly adjusted. So at, at 16, the authority figure was my father, who uh, had different political views than myself. And I, I looked at a map and I tried to figure out 
where I could go and what I could do absolutely upset him the most. I had, I had already closed my school uh, with a newspaper whose headline was Five Ways to Fuck the Principal. And uh, it was written by Abby Hoffman, who there are probably very few of you old enough to remember that name, but that was a, a striking name at the time. And I, I think ours was the only high school newspaper that sold out and made a profit. So in looking at the map, I realized that to really upset my father, I'd have to go to Africa, which is where I went. And uh, I, I thank God ever since that I went to Africa because I fell in love with the continent, with the people. I was in my first coup uh, and managed to get out of the country in Ghana. I was uh, uh, bought my way onto a plane and I, I am probably one of the first people to ever claim asylum in Nigeria. <laughs> so uh, I then hung out in Nigeria till uh, there was another coup in Nigeria and uh, I woke up in the morning and 75 men were crucified on the beach in front of me. I then spoke to my dad for the first time in a long time and managed to arrange a flight out of there. Um, and then uh, the next year uh, ended up in, in Russia uh, under Brezhnev at the time. And uh, I had always been interested in Russia and communism and managed to spend Time. In fact, I opened up a city that had never had a single tourist before, a town called Kishinev, which uh, had been a historical site of pogroms against Jews. And it was a fascinating time. And uh, frankly, uh, having dropped out of high school and then through my father's intervention, managing to get into university and then law school, I will tell you that those experiences, in a way, habituating myself to those different cultures, were completely essential in the career I chose, which was uh, international law and, uh, frankly, international advocacy. Uh, and, and I want to make something clear at the beginning, because people will say, well, you're this you know, human rights lawyer. And I will tell you that nobody is a human rights lawyer with an American, British, or Canadian passport. I have been arrested in many countries, and I get out because of my passport. And my brothers and sisters who are left are murdered, beaten, tortured, and they don't have that passport. And they are the heroes, not those of us who stick our nose in those other cultures. Um, I was privileged to represent the Red Shirt Movement in Thailand, witnessed uh, one of the massacres, uh, managed to get out even though I was charged with various crimes. And, uh, you know, I continue and have all my life seen um, what Western foreign policy looks like on the ground. And uh, it, it's something that really disabuses you of absolutes because you realize how those of us in the West have managed to screw up so many cultures. And when I, when I speak in the United States, I often start off with a series of coups. And I talk about what the United States did to Guatemala in 1954, what we did to Iran, what we did to Chile, what we did to Iraq, what we did, I mean, in, in Congo, um, what we've done in so many countries that, um, again, we weren't alone, we were fighting the Soviets who were engaged in similar battles, but we affected regime change in such a way that uh, we've really completely, uh, completely served those who have been interested in the present, what I call deinstitutionalization. Because we are in a war you are in many ways on the front line of this war. And it is a war for people's minds. And uh, the internet has been weaponized. And we've, we've seen it in 2016 uh, with the aberration of someone like Donald Trump being elected. 
and I'm not going to bash him because everybody <laughs> else is, uh, but also Brexit and a and, uh, hundred other events in Europe uh, where the Russians, in, in using this asymmetric warfare, have been extraordinarily effective. And one only has to realize that the Chinese are now developing what we would call social credit warfare against their own people to recognize the weaponization of the internet that's going on. I, what does that I, mean, socialization? Say more about that. Essentially, uh, you know, for those of us who have been divorced, as I have many times, what happens is your, your credit rating goes down. Well, in China, uh, if you get involved in political no-nos, your social credit rating goes down. China's involved in the massive re-education of the Uyghur population. They, they are uh, moving strongly against Islam and, and the Uyghur for geopolitical reasons, because of the importance of Xinjiang. So what we need to understand is, and as I said, I did this uh, Oxford University debate uh, years ago where I argued and won the debate in saying that uh, the internet was not good for democracy, mm -hmm. that the internet unfortunately uh, empowers uh, many people with resources and money uh, and, and disempowers many others. Although I will tell you, um, I'm privileged to act for Bobby Wine in Uganda, and I will tell you that in Bobby's case, uh, what Museveni's government has had to do is impose a social tax on the internet to stop people from hearing his music and to stop people from, from hearing what he does and what he says so, I mean, it, clearly the internet has the capacity to do both. Unfortunately, those with the greatest resources and, and Zuckerberg's private number are able to extract tremendous benefits and, and we become the victims. I mean, you just, you just start talking at home. Uh, we had this yesterday, uh, last weekend in Portugal. Uh, one of the women I was with kept on talking about wanting a uh, cork trinket, and this morning she woke up to ten advertisements involving cork. She had done nothing more than talk about it, and somehow this started to show up on her phone. Uh, and, and, you know, for those of you who have, I think it's called Alexa or whatever, I mean, believe you me, to any of my clients who are engaged in conduct outside of the church. I tell them that that's a crazy machine to have because it's picking up everything we're thinking or saying. And the internet has not arrived alone. The internet has arrived at a time of greatest inequality. We need to understand that our economy is not working for the many, it is working for the few. And I'm not endorsing Corbyn or Trump or not the, the antithesis to Trump, when I say that, that it, is, it is the contemporaneity of both inequality and growing technological impacts that we really have to be, be cautious of in terms of this, this war that is going on and this deinstitutionalization that is occurring not only here, but Hungary, Poland, the United States, Brazil. I mean, this populist wave is a reaction to growing inequality, deinstitutionalization, and this present crop of political leaders who are able to manipulate technology and resources in such a way that uh, they manage to gain power and then uh, make their, their power uh, ever greater mm -hmm. by attacking these institutions. So can I, so what I hear you talking about in the globalization, all of that, how it's in, in um, played such a huge part. I gave a talk last year on human trafficking and for those of you who attended, if you'll remember all the, you know, the, the things that I spoke about that have made human trafficking more prevalent, the internet, globalization, the 
discrepancy in um, uh, you know how you have very very poor and then very wealthy. Uh, so I was just struck, it struck me as you were talking about that too, just the parallel there, or how, or not even the parallel, but what well, else coming out of it. We're in this era now of the post-truth era. We are in an era where emotions and clicks matter more than truth and expertise. And that's very frightening mm -hmm. because uh, it can lead us into very dark and difficult places. And yet, some of the things that are happening in front of us get no coverage. Um, ten years ago, I helped a woman establish a charity in London for excluded black students because the rate of exclusion of blacks was 96 times whites in the London school system and a, uh, an employee of mine was knifed horribly. Uh, now, that, that which was covered in The Guardian as a big deal 10 years ago is now a daily event here in London. Uh, uh, we're almost in London, it seems, between the mopeds and the knife crime. We're, we're almost into a clockwork orange scenario some days. Um, so, you, you do see not only this deinstitutionalization, but the idea that, uh, for instance, in that, in, in that case, it is not possible to identify the cause, but one of them was the austerity program that was put in that was really a class war. Mm -hmm. And it was a class war which none of us caught at the time. We all thought it was necessary. But it was a class war and it was a race war and we didn't catch it and we didn't catch it in time. And one of the one of the terrible problems of the polarized world that we're in today is that it's very hard to get good analysis anymore. Mm -hmm. Because we so delegitimize uh, sources of information that we don't agree with that uh, we're all left, you know, you can tell a guy's political party in this country by the newspaper he reads, the radio he listens to. And uh, for democracy, that's very scary and that's very dangerous. One of the key signs of this failing of democracy is the war on terror. And I will tell you as a lawyer, there is nothing more frightening to me than the war on terror. Why is it frightening? Firstly, as somebody who's, uh, as a Jew, tremendously sympathetic to Islam, it's frightening because so many of my uh, closest friends I can't even walk in an airport with because of the discrimination and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the victimization that goes on even today in airports, particularly in the United States but also because the government, post 9-11 in the United States, but it's happened here, used every trick in the book to escalate the fear level. Mm -hmm. I would wake up in the morning, I was in a particularly bad marriage right after 9-11, and I would wake up in the morning, and in addition to have my own threat level, <laughs> which, which I would post for the kids so we'd all know how to handle the day, I had a threat level from the United States government to tell me whether I'd be shot on the way to the airport, on the ramp, exactly when the terrorists were going to get me. And the fact of the matter is, I stood a much greater chance of being audited by those sons of bitches than I ever had of being terrorized by anybody. But the United States government is a great government to declare war on its own people. And they've been doing it for a very long time. From the time I was a young man, when we had the war on poverty, which was a good war, one of the few. Then we had the war on drugs, which was a bad war that we're still living with today. Then we had the war on Vietnam, which was a bad war that we're still living with. Then we had, and I say we're still living with it because we're living with some of the ramifications of it. Then we had the, the uh, 
War on Drugs Part Two, which involved all sorts of asset forfeitures and shit that really went against due process. And then we had the War on Terror, which literally stripped us of our rights, which literally set up a system where you could be held uh, on the scantest of evidence uh, for doing things like, um, you know, contributing to terror when terror is barely defined and contributing is barely defined, and you're left knowing that the government has a wild ass level of discretion. And if you're an Arab speaker, knowing that very few natural Arab speakers were even working for the US government at the time, so they could misconstrue almost anything you were saying. So it was a, it was and it is a, uh, a tremendous sign of danger when your government's declaring war on you. And, and that's, you know, when we talk about the rise of Trump and Trumpism and what it means, part of it is because we've been dumbed down by all these fucking wars. We're tired. We're atomized. We don't really know what to do. That pretty soon there's going to be a war against abortion and they're going to take away Roe versus Wade. And what there really is going on is a war against us. And by us, I mean all of us. I mean poor people in Kentucky, just like poor people in Birmingham, England, who so misidentify their actual needs that they're voting for Donnie Trump. Because it's them who got this son of a bitch elected. So when I'm speaking to a whole bunch of people brighter than myself who understand psychiatry, I ask you guys, what the fuck? I mean, really, somebody explain how this happened. I, I'm a dual US and Canadian, so I've always been proud of the Canadian side because we've always had hug, tree-hugging kinds of prime ministers who were gender neutral, who were absolutely <laughs> loving to everybody who cared for the indigenous people, even though we treated them horrifically. They took great pictures. So we, we at least pretended to care. But in the States, it's just incredible. We have one president who tries to get something done when it comes to medical insurance, and we treat him as if he's a war criminal. Uh, and you know, in this country, we take away community. We take away community services. We take away community policing, and we're surprised that you know the levels of street crime are at a level that we've we've never experienced before. But can you speak about Brexit and how that? Well, I mean, look. <laughs> you know, I I think I think Brexit is really, it encapsulates all of my things. One, political leadership that is just completely non-existent. Two, placing the self above country. We have the exact opposite of what this country did in World War II. Every politician going is putting his own interest before the country, and we're left in a complete muddle and mess. The only group that's cohesive are the groups that are truly anti-immigrant. Not exactly the folks you want running the ship. You know? Uh, they're going to kick all the, the bright people of color off. They're going to kick the Polacks who are hard working out. And they're going to keep hard drinking Middle England going. <laughs> well, it's not going to take us very far. So, uh, it, it's when, when Nigel Farage is the emblem of Brexit, you know you are completely screwed. Uh, and of course, when he's hugged and kissed by Trump, you just know, you just know what a serious position we're in. When we're looking to the French president and his wife, who obviously is, you know, something special, and, and he and Angela Merkel are the leaders of the free world. We have serious, serious <laughs> problems. Uh, and then we have a, uh, an overblown sociopath narcissist in Vladimir Putin 
who's looking kind of cool. I'm ready to buy his calendar because I'll tell you, at least he's got a consistent foreign policy. He's fucking everybody. And he's doing it equally. He's doing it effectively. I mean, this guy, I, I'm, whatever, you know, even a pornographic calendar would look good to me because this guy truly is doing it. Okay? I mean, he shook Ukraine to the point where they've elected some kid who's a comedian on television. Uh, if you look at Montenegro, if you look at all of the countries in Europe where the per capita income is something below poverty, the Russians and the Chinese are basically running the show. Mm. The Chinese have this new Belt and Road Initiative, mm. which is absolutely amazing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I work a lot in Africa, and it's just amazing. I can get a better Chinese takeout in any number of African capitals than I can get in London today. And I mean, let me tell you, they are all over the place, and Africans are getting very pissed off. That's the interesting thing. This is post-colonialism, but it, it actually isn't doing the Chinese a lot of good in terms of how they are seen in Africa. But in terms of the rest of the world, what they're doing is they're exporting their surplus capacity. And they're doing it brilliantly. The Chinese Communist Party knows that China must grow by 6% a year or face internal conflict. The Belt and Road Initiative is a foreign policy initiative to suit the domestic needs of the Chinese Communist Party. That's what it is. And it's going to be very effective. Mm -hmm. Why is Maduro still in power in Venezuela? Uh -huh. Only because <coughs> of Putin and Xi Jinping. Yeah. That's why he's still there. I know Venezuela very well. We represented one of the big political prisoners there, uh, Lopez, who just uh, has fled to the Spanish embassy is a guy we've worked with. We can talk about that more, like what it's like to come in and represent one of those oppositional figures and what they've been through, and we're talking about torture beyond belief, we're talking about persecution, and you know, what is that like? Well, what, what I can tell you from, from our experience is that um, people like <coughs> Bobby Wine, or people like, um, you know, in some cases in Zambia, we represented President Banda. Uh, President Banda was wrongfully accused of many crimes because President Sata, who had taken over from him, was insecure politically. And, and one of the things that I've learned in my lengthy period at the bar of now just about 40 years, is there's, no mu there's nothing more dangerous than the war on, in this case, corruption. Because when African leaders go to war on corruption, you know sure as hell what that means. That means they're trying to go after the schmuck who's slightly more corrupt, they think, than they are, <laughs> and may have more resources to steal the next election. So, in, in the case of our representation of President Banda, we were blessed. He is an amazing individual who was not corrupt. His sin was that he was pro-Chinese, which was very unpopular with the United States, who helped fund his opponent. And one of the ways in today's world that you delegitimize people is you charge them with criminal offenses. So this has become rule one of the playbook. Charge them with political offenses. And I think from a psychological standpoint, what's always fascinating, whether it's Bobby Wine or Yukos or Thailand, we represent the Richards and Shinawatra, is that you're always trying to understand the code because all these leaders speak in code mm. and they speak to their own followers in code. And you need to get that code, because if you don't get that code, you're in trouble, especially if you're, you know, in the case of Zambia, a white Jew trying to represent their esteemed president. 
you know, I, I certainly ran into a few roadblocks. But we ended up winning because you very often find that good, detailed, legal work can win the day. And this is one of the things that I find very frustrating about Brother Avenatti, this American lawyer who's all, he was on every talk show every day. The only problem was he really wasn't a great lawyer. So while he was a great celebrity, he ended up losing all his cases, losing his credibility, and now he's facing I don't know how many fraud charges for various things. But the, the problem is, in the political cases we do, you have to take the legal system apart. So in the Yukos case, we represented Russia's leading uh, civil society leader, who, thank God, was also their richest man. And we were fighting Mr. Putin, who wanted to uh, steal the oil company, take the money, and really take power by knocking out those who could form an opposition. Because politicians in today's market, they look at, at resources. So if you've got oil, you've got gas, you've got banking, then even if you're neutral, they will deem you to be a political opponent. Mm -hmm. And in Khodorkovsky's case, they charged him with tax evasion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it was an incredible scene to witness because when he, he, the Russians first started to go after Khodorkovsky, I had met him a few months before, and uh, he seemed to be extraordinarily bright, equally arrogant, um, and completely convinced that he was involved with Nobody could touch him. And of course, sadly, uh, for those of you who don't know, he was arrested uh, in <coughs> Siberia and uh, went through uh, terrible traumas in jail, uh, in pretrial detention, where they would pick him up in a truck, drive it around town till he soiled himself for hours and hours, then take him into court to sit in a cage, expecting he would break, but he never broke. And it was a privilege to represent him. And it fascinating. I, I'm a student of Russia, so I was able to understand the Russia code, which was quite fascinating because we had our own people, our own PR people in Russian, our own PR people in English, and they were completely separate. Because what you were saying in Russia was very different than what you were saying in English. And uh, because I had been trained in Russia, I understood the Russian side of it fairly well. And uh, I was unfortunately arrested in 2005 by Mr. Putin. Uh, and, and fortunately, um, managed to talk my way on to a deportation as opposed to a, a jail. But uh, two of the people who worked with me had been, since that time, murdered. And uh, I had dinner in Moscow with a friend of mine who was a journalist named Anna Politkovskaya. She was a very heroic journalist, and she brought a young lawyer that she wanted to have work with me. And within one year of that dinner, they had both been murdered in separate events. So when people talk to me about you know, isn't Africa dangerous? I say to them, trust me, Russia, <laughs> Russia competes with any country when it comes to the danger that opposition faces, as we've seen with the assassination of so many. Um, so what, what I think in terms of sort of this Pope truth Kelly and Conway world in which we live. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are not aware of Kelly Ann Conway, she is a key Trump advisor who's going through a marital dispute in front of 300 million Americans. Her husband is a vicious Trump antagonist, and the two of them are going at it in the press every day. 
and allegedly sleeping in the same bed, so God <coughs> bless them. But in the in the Kelly Ann Conway world that we live in, this post-truth world, she's the one who coined the term alternate facts. <laughs> we we lose a tremendous amount of the anchor that holds us together. And I think the challenge for you in your everyday lives is dealing with the loss of that collective anchor and trying to figure out, we, even with our children or our spouses, to what do we connect ourselves? How do we connect ourselves now where so many of our most important um, institutions and, and um, totems like rule of law are being so uh, dismissed and so denigrated. Well, I think it also, um, well, a couple of things that you said when you were talking about breaking the code. I feel like that's a lot of what we do with individuals, with families, but we talk about it as trying to join with, understand our clients, speak their language, so that we can somehow have an end into the system that operates differently than we do. Um, and I was thinking about, and again, all of the trauma that you um, interact with and the fear underneath it all that's got everyone on high alert so that everything, you know, in at least these political climates comes through that filter so that everything is subject as well to misinterpretation because if you're on alert and you're fighting a war, then you're really working from that kind of limbic brain place of fight or flight. And if you and I are having a war or we're having an argument, then you could ask me a question like, would you like some more water? And I might say, you know, what do you mean? I already have water. You know, So everyone's sort of on high alert. And do you think that it's, you know, can you speak more to that fear place underneath it all that's driving, um, driving the political climate that we have today and throwing all of us into almost that existential angst again. I mean, I see a rise in teen suicide in the States. Mm -hmm. I see a rise in addiction. We have a hundred and we're having a war now with opiates. 172 people a day, you know, dying from overdoses. And I see our teens struggling with that, really that existential question of in a place of so much pain and suffering, how do I make meaning out of my life? And I think we can all go there. Well, I mean, to be honest, I think we're all suffering from adrenal exhaustion. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, it is, it is uh, extremely hard to break down this cacophony of noise we're all living in and try to filter what matters from what doesn't matter. And I know that, um, you know, in the political and legal work, we do, that it's all about attempting to simplify things to two or three issues, as opposed to trying to do everything in such a complex way. I mean, Isaiah Berlin had the this pivotal article, The Fox and the Hedgehog, and the issue was whether political leaders should be a hedgehog who focuses on <coughs> one thing to the exclusion of everything or a fox who scans the wide horizon and, and knows a bit about a lot. And I think in today's society, we really have to be both. We have to be the fox in terms of scanning the environment. But we have to instill in our children and ourselves the hedgehog, at least in holding together certain basic principles like truth and you know um, however bad a situation may be I've tried with my children they might say unsuccessfully to speak the truth and to just tell it like it is and, and I was privileged to interview Vaclav Havel who really originated the term speaking truth to power and I think that a good opposition speaks truth to power. 
That's what Bobby Wine is doing in Uganda. That's what many opposition leaders have tried to do in Zimbabwe. Uh, that's what very few people ended up doing in Nigeria. So we have Buhari again, uh, which is a tragedy. Um, speaking truth to power and, and trying to make truth as an organizing principle is one of the things you can do. Um, what, when I see political debate now in the United States, and I see how the Democrat Party has completely screwed themselves in their obsession with Trump, and have basically dropped what they stand for in terms of just trying to become oppositionists. Uh, and I remember Sam Irvin and Watergate and, and people who really understood what the Constitution meant. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more than a tragedy in that I think of what we're educating our children. We are, we are educating our children to watch these uh, sycophantic, celebrity-driven mm -hmm. schmucks uh, <laughs> take control. And there just doesn't, you know, there really doesn't seem to be a real opposition to, to fight them. And I think that's, that's the tragedy. We've lost role models. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've lost leaders. And... Uh, like, what are our ideologies? Well, you know, what it, right. And, and, and one of the ideologies appears to be to heighten our antagonism towards the other, whether the other is black, whether the other is Islam, whether the other is, in this country, a Jew. Uh, I mean, we, we have in this country a very serious crisis of anti-Semitism. And, you know, my black friends, are coming to me saying, you have a real problem. Like, do you know you guys have a problem? We think we have, you guys, you guys have a problem. Pretty soon they'll be excluding you from school. I mean, it's pretty scary in this country. The Labor Party has a serious problem with Jews, um, which is incredible to believe. Uh, and, and that anti-Semitism I see growing in France, uh, Germany, you know, it, it, it really exists, and it is growing. Uh, in Poland, it exists without Jews, which is truly unique. So uh, this othering is a big deal. Right now, the president is uh, making Mexican immigrants the other. And he has this horrific kid in the White House with him. Uh, goading him on. So we're putting children in cages. Um, it, it, is, it is just incomprehensible what's going on in the States. And you know, a lot of people have asked me, because I actually was paid, thank God, to investigate Mr. Trump. And a lot of people have asked me, well, you know, did he do it? Did he collude with Russia? And the answer is really simple. The Russians were too smart to try to collude with Donald Trump. <laughs> you don't have to collude with a schmuck. You don't collude with a dog. You guide the dog to where he needs to piss. And that's what they did with Trump. They. You don't, if you understand how the KGB, FSB operate, they don't sign a deal with you. They guide you in a certain direction, and then that's what you do. So that's essentially what happened. There doesn't have to be a deal, a contract, collusion. There has to be a manipulation. Mm -hmm. And that manipulation occurred via Facebook, via any number of organizations. That's what happened. Now, in fairness to Donald Trump, the Mueller report did not prove collusion. 
It may have proven 12 different methods of obstruction, but it didn't prove pollution. But nobody went a step further to say, but were the Russians successful? The answer was yes. Did they use another means? The answer is yes. And the problem with that is that they've been doing it in this country and throughout Europe mm -hmm. for generations. I may be one of the few in this room, there may be a couple of others, uh, who remember when they, the Russians took over the German government. Literally took over the German government in the 80s. They were running Willy Brandt's office. Incredible. And they were in charge of the whole anti-nuclear movement. They did a phenomenal job. Hats off to the KGB. You could do a Broadway play about how well they managed to play the West. So what they're doing now is just sort of a pathetic version of what they did in Germany. But now, thanks to the internet, they were able to do it in the United States. You also studied Hitler. You have a podcast where you talk about that. And, um, and talked about how you lost many of your family um, during the Holocaust. Can you talk a little bit about that and those psychological dynamics, how that's helped? Well, I, I can't. I'm going to leave to everybody here to talk psychological dynamics. If I start to use that lingo at all, it will just be a great embarrassment. Oh. Um, what, I, what I think one of the great lessons of, there are a few lessons from studying how Hitler took power. Number one is that Russia played a very big role. Russia helped finance Hitler. And that never really comes out anywhere. But the Russians played a very big role in bankrupting bankrupt, bankrupt, the Nazis. Number two, one of the things that's fascinating is how effective the Nazis were in terms of the German economy. And we often don't give enough credit where credit is due. They did a hell of a good job with the economy. You know, I think about where we are in the U.S. right now with unemployment. It scares the shit out of me when I, when I look at those numbers and I realize that Mr. Trump, every, every quarter, is taking more and more credit for himself. But the bottom line was they took power from within through the declaration of an emergency. And that emergency power in Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution involved a constitutional coup. And that's one of the dramatically scary things about where we are living today in the U.S. and England. And, and in, in England, I mean, my God, what's going on in the cabinet right now? Who the hell knows? You, you, you have no idea. I mean, uh, Allegedly, it's Mays diabetes that's causing all of this mush and gas. I don't know. This was Williamson's uh, counterattack, allegedly. I have no idea. But we're in a total dis we're, we're in a total meltdown here, um, which again uh, seems to be almost without end, and with no mechanism to find our way out. The conservatives don't want an election because they know they'll lose. Corbyn doesn't necessarily want to give May a deal because he's afraid that'll keep her in power. Uh, so everybody, again, is putting their own self-interest before that of the nation. And it's, uh, it, it's really a tremendous problem. Well, and what I hear you saying, too, is that with all that, you know, everything's running by fear, so fear-based, that everything gets distorted. Uh, facts get distorted, people don't know what to believe, they don't know which direction to go in, um, and that's scary just looking at it in that way. Well, and I, and I think that, you know, in our defense of political leaders in the last decade, what's been, what's kind of fear-based to all of this is the ability of states to use laws and garner support, whether you color it in anti-corruption or you, you color it in some other uh, sort of bogus charge, there is a constant attempt to gain for the state legitimacy, and I, I call it a presumption of regularity. 
we look at Russia and Russia charges people with corruption and we think their prosecutors are like our prosecutors, but they're not. Mm -hmm. We think their jails are like our jails, but they no, they're not. In this case, interestingly, their jails are better. In the United States and in England, we imprison people and we know they're going to get raped, we know they're going to get brutalized, and we treat it as like part of the punishment. Mm -hmm. It is an obscenity that we're living with in terms of what's happening in our penal institutions. <laughs> In the United States, there is a prison business. And the reason we were caging young children is because that son of a bitch who was the attorney general before had a friend who was in the business of private prisons. And he thought this was another profit industry. We can cage up Mexicans and make a fortune. So it is truly shocking how we allow prisons in this country and in the United States to engage in that kind of brutal, laissez-faire, you know, let shit happen to people because they don't deserve to live. Well, we've been imprisoning our addicts uh, for, you know, decades over in the, in the United States. I mean, by the, you know, groves. And if we imprison someone with any other disease for having that disease and the symptoms of it would be an absolute outrage but now there's even a show i can't remember i saw it on netflix that goes and it's about it's a british guy who does it it's about the world's worst prisons so are the so they go through and they have a russian prison and they have a Colombian prison, and then they actually have a Norwegian prison that actually looks quite lovely. They have a coffee machine and espresso. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think I, I think that um, I've seen a lot of prisons. Um, I would say that American prisons are more towards the bottom, as are British prisons, than the top. But what about even this infatuation with prisons? And now we're going to have a TV show out there, or a series, where people will, it's been very popular, where now we want to even look at the prisons and look at people who are imprisoned and, you know. Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's part of um, the privatization of everything. And I guess this is where, I, I would hate to say I'm more sympathetic to some of what Gordon says, I think, I think we have so outsourced so many essential public functions mm -hmm. uh, and we've, we've imposed a profit motive where we used to impose a legal imperative mm -hmm. that we've, we've sold ourselves down the river. Mm -hmm. And, and we, uh, we are going to need a dramatic rethink because people don't lose their humanity because they're imprisoned. Uh, they've just had shit lawyers because we all know if you had a good lawyer, you wouldn't be in prison. And the so world is watching the Kardashians and the prison shows. I mean, that's the other piece of what we're propagating. In well, and it's another reason why the United States has lost so much of its soft power, let alone the UK. Soft power used to be an impregnable bastion of Western strength. We don't realize, but the date we lost soft power was 2008. In the rest of the world, when our economy melted down, the Washington consensus was seen for being the phony shit it was, and we all lost a tremendous amount of safety, mm -hmm. security, and respect because of this lack of consensus. And I think that, that being able to date it at least allows us to try to find some ways to right the ship, though it's, it's very difficult. I'm wondering if anyone has any, is this a good time for us to open up to questions? Absolutely. I mean, we've got, yeah, absolutely. Do we have a mic or is it just the one I have? I can project. Can you hear? Let me just because of the back. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating, and I, I agree with all you say. I, I was thinking about also the postmodern movement, which started in the 80s, which has really, really kind of shot itself on the foot in the sense that 
oh, but you know, there's no black and white, there's no truth, and you know, they're, they're just perspectives. And I think this whole idea of fake news has kind of, you know, uh, come out of that. But my question to you is, you know, what about people like Julian Assange, you know, like WikiLeaks and all, like, where is he on the political food chain now? Well, um, I'm involved in a case right now where uh, an extortionist is pretending to be a whistleblower. And that that's something that uh, I think the world is churning on the Assangers to some extent. Whistleblowing, when you are an employee of a company and you come across a problem, whistleblowing can be a salutary thing to do. What's happened Assange and post-Assange, is that people are stealing documents, invading privacy, and think it's okay if they can parlay it into uh, headlines. And just because somebody's rich doesn't mean that they don't have a right to privacy. So I'm not wildly high on Assange. I have spoken at the same uh, event as he did some years ago in New Zealand. And it was, to be honest, I was worried about what incarceration was doing to him because he seemed a bit out of it. Uh, Snowden, on the other hand, who did a lot more, uh, and a lot more effectively, is incredibly brilliant and competent. But Snowden's a true whistleblower. Assange, in my humble opinion, is not. Um, and what Snowden was demonstrating was the capacity of five eyes to basically out you wherever you are in the world. And, you know, it was an incredibly scary power, as a result of which uh, U.S. law changed, whereas uh, Assange became, as you know, a tool of the Russians and uh, was a big part of some of the disruption that happened in 2016. So I think that that we, we do subtly support this class war, which I'm against. In fact, I, uh, I'm very proud to say that we, we, we fight for rich people as hard as we fight for poor people. Uh, because very few people want to admit they help the rich, which I think is kind of funny, because uh, firstly, they pay better than the poor. Um, and secondly, uh, they're human beings with rights to privacy as much as anybody else. But we've made them a political stalking horse, and uh, some of it's deserved, but a lot of it's not deserved. I'll also say I've had the privilege of representing uh, President Erdogan. He's somebody that uh, many people in this room and other rooms think of as being something of an antichrist. And as a Muslim leader, I can understand that, but in reality, uh, he's deeply faith-based, he's done incredible things for his country, and he has a completely different world view that very few people ever express, because we, we now caricature political leaders our government doesn't like, we don't actually portray their reality, and we make uh, we make a fetish of this term <coughs> democracy without truly understanding what democracy is. Is democracy one man, one vote? Is democracy greater literacy, greater health, uh, greater health care? Uh, to my mind, uh, democracy is wrapped up in human dignity. Mm. And without human dignity, you can't even pretend to have democracy. Uh, in Uganda, and I'm sorry to keep hitting Uganda, but that's where I'm, my brain is living, because Bobby was only arrested last week, and just freed. So in, in Uganda, people can have a vote, but they can also be beaten on the street. They also have no jobs. They also have no access to the internet. So you really do have to not make democracy a fetish, but 
make democracy uh, a concept that's understood as involving the dignity of man. And that's why the German Constitution is as important as the American Constitution in expressing that fundamental need of human dignity, expressing um, you know, proportionality as a guiding principle. You know, there's a lot of very important things about human rights in Europe that's somewhat broader than what we deal with in the U.S. I have a question, then I'll pass it out again to you. Sure. Um, many, many of you I know have grown up through apartheid in Pakistan. You've also been warriors yourself. And how do you take care of yourself? We call it secondary post-traumatic stress, tr stress disorder, and then post-traumatic stress disorder, or seeing you know, people executed, killed, dealing with um, hearing the stories. How do you take care of yourself through all that? Well, firstly, as is probably obvious, I don't do a great job. <laughs> Secondly, um, I think that uh, I've always found the combat in marriage worse than the combat I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that uh, as somebody who both suffers and enjoys ADD, um, I have a very high tolerance for risk. Um, and I feel I've been privileged to work in the countries and the people I've worked with. And um, don't spend a lot of time, I mean, I, I always have young lawyers uh, who say to me, um, don't you get scared going to X or going to Y or going to Z? And I tell them, look, or journalists asking that question, if you have to even think about it, don't do it. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we don't have security, which we have, uh, and we don't take foolish risks, but at the same time, I, I have a, a U.S. and Canadian passport, which is makes me a lot safer than my colleagues. And now, uh, I'm banned before I even enter the country. Museveni banned me in Uganda before I got to Uganda. Sata banned me in Zambia before I got to Zambia. So I, I've, I'm like the, the home run hitter who's batting fourth in the lineup and then the pitcher pitches out to them so you don't get a chance to bat. So the last few countries I've been retained in, they don't even let me in. So I think it's a, a matter of um, not, you know, when your client, as in Uganda, was being tortured, you're really not worried about yourself, you're worried about your client. And as you get older, uh, and I think that's what's kind of interesting as I hit 60 and beyond, you start to worry a lot less about shit. Um, because you figure your number's up soon anyway. Who gives a fuck? You know, uh, you'd sooner go out with a bang than a whimper. So I think it's and, and the the chaos of life is such that um, risk, in a weird way, is kind of enjoyable because you get off on it in a way that drugs no longer work. So I think. Um, I, I, I think it's important not to self-obsess and not to uh, over, you know, not to do the Avenatti thing where you try to become the story. Um, fortunately, I represent highly charismatic people. When you're with Bobby Wine, you don't really become the story. So, uh, what fascinates me about Bobby and others is that we have a generational revolution going on. That. I'm witnessing that's just incredible. In, in Uganda, 80% of the populace is under 35. Bobby's an old guy. Uh, and that youth movement is going to change Africa, Northern Africa, it's changing Algeria, uh, and it's going to change the world. And I think that's a movement that the Chinese and the Russians will be completely out of touch with. And that's an area where our Western soft power might reassert itself because on the streets 
people are excited by the dynamism of the intellectual forces that are at loose in the West. And, and that's why um, the, the fight over artificial intelligence, and, and it's not just a chance that Xi Jinping is saying China must control artificial intelligence. I mean, we are going to be blending mind and machine in the next 20 years. We are going to be in a whole new technology. Uh, super minds are going to be coming into existence. Um, and, and those super minds, perhaps even greater than some of those in this room, are going to be incredibly powerful engines. And the question is, will those engines work for humanity or against? And that's, uh, that's something that uh, some of you in this room will live to witness. And, uh, <laughs> That's going to be fascinating. I'm going to let you talk. Okay. Oh, I saw a hand over there, so. Okay. Could I just ask you, please, uh, what is your prognosis for Europe, and what would you say to the Mandarins in Brussels? Look, you know, to be honest with you, I find Europe fucking boring. I mean, I am like. Um, I, I don't keep up with Brussels, uh, and I'm, I'm very alive to what's happening in the individual states. I have clients who are victims of political cases. I did a Holocaust case in Austria that sickened me, where I represented a Jewish guy who had been arrested uh, because he was a Jew, and, and this is just a few years ago, and because he had written a book uh, outing the Catholic Church in Austria. He was uh, uh, claustrophobic. They put him in a, a small cell. They tortured him. Uh, and this, this is going on in the EU today. Uh, they, while his uh, Muslim uh, prisoners were allowed halal food, they didn't give him kosher food. Uh, it was the Muslim pres prisoners that gave him their food that he could eat. Uh, it was horrific what went on in Austria. So uh, there's, uh, in the Czech Republic right now, I have uh, a client, a billionaire client, who is facing uh, political uh, charges, potentially, on, on completely uh, jacked up uh, cases. Uh, in Poland, we're seeing uh, really destruction of the independent judiciary. Uh, so I'm, I'm monitoring these legal issues more than I'm monitoring various directives. Though I will say that this attack on money laundering that's been going on, where we're defending a number of, of completely innocent businessmen who have been caught up in, in bullshit money laundering charges that come about because of press reports, unsubstantiated press reports. In Europe today, you can have your bank account frozen if somebody writes a nasty article about you. No judge, no jury, no hearing, a lousy newspaper article, and your assets are frozen. That's pretty goddamn scary. And that's going on all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ali Sentam. Incidentally, I'm from Uganda. Really? <laughs> and um, I run a charity um, specializing in um, uh, treating prevention and rehabilitation of uh, people suffering from um, drugs and alcohol. Um, Mr. Amsterdam, you've done a great job in Uganda with Bobby White, and we are hopeful that maybe he will be um, our next leader. <coughs> However, um, Bobby Wine um, was uh, was an addict before, or oh, a user, um, like a, any other person. We've had uh, um, Barack Obama in his youthful stage, he used. But uh, we have um, information coming from the corridors of the government that uh, he may be banned because of his previous using of alcohol, I mean, of, of drugs. Is there any 
law that can prevent that on an international level? Well, look, you know, uh, the government just charged him with fomenting a disturbance in respect to his activity in 2018 involving the internet tax. They will invent whatever to try to stop him. We are engaged in a whole process now of trying to make a free and fair election conditional, a, a condition of foreign aid to Uganda. That is one way to try to protect <coughs> the system, which has been horribly rigged. As you know, Basidji has had elections stolen from him. Uh, whether we'll be successful, I'm not going to uh, say. I mean, we've just seen the Congo election robbed from somebody, and yet the West has stayed quiet. It's going to be up to the Ugandan people, and obviously uh, I'm hopeful that the Ugandan people are going to make a strong showing in terms of uh, Bobby Wine and the next election. Um. Next. Just to say thank you very much for a beautiful narrative on Africa. I think, uh, from an African, I'd just like to thank you very much because uh, it's very difficult to actually hear people speak so progressively about the continent and you seem to do that. Um, my question would be, in regards to the Belt and Road, what would your advice be to a young African about the invasion of China, if I may use? And also, what would, you, um, what would your advice be to an African leader right now about the Belt and Road? Look, China's investment in Africa, in most states, the loans and whatnot are about 15%. I would say, take the money and run. <laughs> you know, honestly, these are my brothers, take the fucking money. You know, the key is, don't sign up to neo-colonial deals where you get the money but they take all the resources forever. Yeah. Do it in a way where the government still has control and stop China from exporting its labor. The biggest problem on the streets of Nigeria, on the streets of uh, Zambia, are unemployed black yeah. youths yeah. that are being displaced by Chinese workers. That is an obscenity. Mm -hmm. That has to stop. And it's not in China's interest, nor is it in Africa's interest to allow that to continue. So, uh, you know, I think that's hugely important. You know, and I think the, um, the, the reason I push my kids to travel is that when I look at Africa, I view it as, although I don't look African, I'll admit. I, I, I view it more as somebody who's almost, you know, when you're there as a boy, it becomes part of you. Yeah. And, and what I tell my children is they have to, you know, find <coughs> places where they can really uh, be local. Because from our standpoint, you can't represent Bobby Wine or Banda or Texan if you don't feel emotionally what's, what's going on. It's the same thing when I've represented uh, Turkey. You have to really understand the pain of how they see Jerusalem. Understand these different worldviews if you are going to fully represent people. And then sometimes you have to bury your own, if you can. But you have to, uh, you know, to be an advocate, you, you can't parse what they believe from what you believe and then blend them. You actually have to advocate their views because that's your job. Can you, can you just give us your thoughts on Israel right now? Well, look. Um, I am a huge admirer of a lot in Israel. I love Israel. I'm on the board of Haifa University. I detest Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, 
I detest the idea of Jews as a colonizing state. Uh, I think that's uh, wildly dangerous for us as a people. Um, so I'm a sort of Yitzhak Rabin Jew, which is pretty hard since he's dead and Bibi has been reelected. Bibi is everything I would want to be leading Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty interesting. My, uh, when one of my boys was about to be bar mitzvahed, I was in Israel and uh, a friend of mine uh, called me and said, I'm, you know, for your son's bar mitzvah, I'm going to have you meet Bibi Netanyahu. <laughs> <laughs> and this was before Bibi was Bibi. So I called a friend of mine who I really trusted and I said, should I introduce Jake to Netanyahu? And he said, no, <laughs> that's not who you want your son to look up to. So, I mean, like many Jews, I think my feelings towards Israel are of both complete devotion on one hand and on the other hand, complete angst about some of the policies that are going on. Do I think that the wildly anti-Israel uh, coverage that you get in the media here is fair? Absolutely not. Uh, the University of Haifa, where I'm on the board, is a fully integrated university. Jews, Arabs, Druze working together, it's incredible, it's magnificent, as is Haifa, by the way. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we are a small microcosm and you have this growing, you know, we have our own uh, um, ultra right, and uh, they're frightening, they're growing by leaps and bounds, and it's scary to me, speaking personally. Uh, but the world is scary. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, my mother would warn me about anti Semitism, and I would laugh. And uh, she would tell me that when I was in, because I used to travel all the time, that whenever I was traveling, I should, if I was in trouble as a Jew, go to a mosque. So I was, you know, my children are shocked when I tell them that the advice of my mother was always to find a mosque. That's where you're comfortable. That's where you, that's where you should be if you're in trouble. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a diff it was a different world. If I told a kid in London to go find a mosque, they'd think I was crazy. But that's how we grew up. Um, and, you know, strangely still, even in the States now, when there's been a, uh, an outrage against a mosque, it's often the Jewish community that's the first there. And when there was this outrage of the synagogue murders, it was the Muslim community that raised all the money to help the synagogue. So there's a deep bond there. Just when you have Netanyahu, we see what just happened in Gaza. And you see now the instrument, the instrumentalization of the Palestinian conflict by the Iranians. That's a whole new thing. And that's tremendously, tremendously dangerous because we have Yemen, which is a <coughs> human rights horror, which is now a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that can spread and that can, uh, you know, that, that can be a tinderbox. Um, so we have time um, for one more question. Okay, perfect. Hi. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, over here, Mr. Hunter. Um Thank you so much for everything which you spoke on. I've been making loads of notes and recorded it. Um, I really appreciated what you were saying earlier about how difficult it is to get a good analysis, and I think sometimes just the over-influx of information, I'm not sure if that's the right use of words, a lot of information basically makes things quite confusing. My question is, um, or more, my thoughts are that in the UK at the moment, um, so coming from my position, I'm a um, you know, dedicated sort of progressive um, mental health worker, anti-racist campaigner, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also found myself in the Labour Party in, in 2015. Um, and having seen what the party's gone through over the last few years, um, uh, it's very easy to be disillusioned. Uh, it's very easy to be disillusioned with the entire political um, process in this uh, political makeup in this country. Um, but I feel there's a lot of policies, foreign policies, international policies, which uh, Corbyn has spoken about, spoken for, uh, which you've mentioned. 
Um, I guess my question is really like with with the sort of current an anti-Semitism crisis. I feel like as a, a Labour Party member, I've I've seen a lot that's come through. I've seen I've been involved in workshops, I've ed educated myself. A lot of um, other people in the party have done similar sort of work. Um, I was just wondering what I I feel like I might still not be seeing something. Um, for you to have said that it's kind of on a similar level to some of the other crises which you've spoken about, saying that you, be, you have a real problem, or Jews in this country have a real existential problem. And I was just wondering what you've seen that has made you come to that conclusion. The Labour Party is owned by Labour thugs in a bunch of unions. And those Labour thugs have equated uh, Israel and Jews and capital in a way that I haven't seen since the 30s. I mean, I didn't see it in the 30s. I'm old, but not that old. But um, th that equation is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Corbyn uh, dedicated a, a book that was written in the late 19th century recently that was full of anti-Semitic tropes. Mm -hmm. you, you have a leader who is actively anti-Semitic. And while Corbyn is the leader of the Labour Party, I have zero trust in labor. Because if they can tolerate, if, if, and believe me, if he was saying it about blacks or people who follow Islam, my feelings would be the same. I would not be able to support somebody who said that. And what scares me about this country is it's fucking politically correct to be anti-Semitic. And I don't accept that. I mean, uh, that's crazy shit. And that is uh, passable in the Labour Party in this country. And this Chakrabadi lady, this human rights person, who wrote that fucked up report about anti-Semitism, she should be stripped of her designation. Clearly, she went to the Lords based on an ugly deal. That's certainly how it appears. I don't know if it's true. But it looks like it was sort of a wink-wink deal to deal with anti-Semitism. And that's shameful for anybody who wants to wear a sort of human rights badge. So um, while Corbyn's leader, I just have no time for labor. Can I ask what was the name, so, was the name of the book? Yeah. So Viola, you've had your I can't remember, but it's in the papers just the last two or three days. Okay. Well, it's very strong affirmations he endorsed in the book. I can't remember the name of the book, but I saw some somebody send me. It's very, uh, quite, uh, you know, strong affirmations about the, uh, the Jews, Jews in world owning capital. all the banks and owning all the media and, um, and is endorsed by Corbyn. Mm -hmm. I mean, any group that you say, you know, uh, uh, as you're saying, the blacks and the, the people from Islam own all this and all those, and is yeah. endorsed by Corbyn. I mean, it's true. Okay, so uh, thank you very much and you went around the world. I was, born, I was born in Iraq and then moved to Lebanon and fly to another country before the war. So I'm Venezuelan, you mentioned Maduro, so we'll talk about that later, it's a long story. Now living in Cyprus for some reason, going again to a divided place. So you mentioned many countries and I wonder what's your opinion about what's going on in Cyprus? And what will be, yeah, your opinion? Well, I mean, to be to be very frank, in Venezuela, I represented the main political prisoner against Chavez and, and freed him, Eligio Cedeno. I've been involved in Venezuela for twenty years, more. I, I have not been involved in Cyprus. I can't say a word that's intelligent about Cyprus. Uh, so I won't. Not intelligent. <laughs> no, no I, I mean, I've been involved in a few cases there. I haven't studied the politics. I certainly know about when the government stole people's savings and all of that stuff. Uh, but there's nothing in that. I mean, I don't want to speculate about a country I don't know. Thank you. But this lady had a question. It was a while back I wanted to ask you, and you briefly touched on Yemen. I was going to ask you about the Middle East because it was the one area you hadn't mentioned, and especially what um, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the blockade of Qatar, and I was going to ask about it. So it's a very dangerous game, and I just wondered what you felt the implications of it, not only for the Middle East, but for the rest of the world. Well, look, uh, firstly, we need to understand something. that. Uh, 
Trump made a deal in Saudi Arabia. He basically gave the Saudis carte blanche for a hundred billion dollar investment and military purchase. Mm -hmm. And then the Saudis immediately declared fucking war on Qatar. <coughs> and Trump never realized that the largest military base is actually in Qatar. Um, so that was a deeply problematic uh, yeah. delegation. In law, we have this issue of improper delegation. And in fact, what we've seen in the Middle East is a completely improper delegation of power to the Saudis, mm -hmm. which they've managed to withstand Khashoggi's murder. They've managed to withstand a tremendous amount, the imprisonment of a lot of their elite, the theft of their economic resources, which have gone on without any comment from the West, barely. Um, the Saudis have a, a very dangerous hold on American foreign policy. You hear about the Jewish lobby all the time. I will tell you, the Jewish lobby wishes it had the power of the Saudis. The Saudis have the real power, hidden by the Jewish lobby. The, the Saudis have the ear and the pocket of Trump. Mr. Kushner has made deal after deal mm -hmm. with uh, MBS, and um, it will take years before we understand the private interests of Jared Kushner, mm -hmm. his anger at the Qataris, and what that meant in terms of the Middle East as we see it. Um, one of the things about the Trump administration has been this massive delegation of massive responsibility to incompetent people. Um, Kushner may be a bright boy, I, I don't know, but nobody can be bright enough to take all of the fields that he's been asked to investigate, including just, by the way, peace in the Middle East. So uh, I think we will for a long time, a long time, harvest these seeds of incompetence the United States has had a tremendous problem of competence in its foreign policy. It is exacerbated 100-fold mm -hmm. by the present administration. Although the present administration has some great opportunities, they could actually remove Maduro. Why they would hesitate when that would give them Florida and a whole bunch of states, I don't know. Uh, they could actually reach some sort of economic deal with North Korea put a bunch of Trump golf courses there, which is really what Kim Jong-un wants. The West probably has no greater admirer than Kim, and all he wants is a picture of him and Don on some 18-hole golf course. <laughs> He'd be happy. Um, but it is this reduction of competence that we've seen in the world that is one of the dramatic highlights of this century that we'll all have to live with as we, the Chinese move into artificial intelligence and everything else and start landing men and machines on the moon and Mars. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. It's been yeah, interesting. You. Thank you. thank you, Robert. Thank you, Heather.